Carpet out of gold, presenting they've got stories to tell, excavating the legacies of little known African American leaders. Dr. Nevergold is a graduate of Buffalo State College and she received her doctorate from the University of Buffalo. She co founded the Uncrowned Queens Institute for Research and Education on Women and has worked to create a model for the reclamation, collection, preservation, and dissemination. Um, the dissemination of the biographic histories of African American community builders. She is the author of numerous books and other publications preserving Western New York history. And now I will turn the mic over to Dr. Nevergold. Thank you, Leah. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's so great to see. Uh, everyone out, I want to thank the library for providing this opportunity to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart and for bringing together such a wonderful and diverse group of authors uh, sharing their experiences. So over the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to share my experience, one, uh, in developing research or researching various resources to write uh, the histories that I've been writing, and secondly, to share my experiences with, uh, uh, with uh, publishing uh, and getting those writings out. No, I think, there we go. So I know question and answer is after this presentation, but I wanted to ask you, the audience, a couple questions, just to get a, a sense of who I'm talking to. So how many of you have show of hands uh, are primarily non-fiction writers. Okay. How many are fiction writers? Oh, many more. Thank you. Um, how many are family historians? One? Oh, okay. Two, three? That's great. And how many of you have been published over here? Okay. So, you all have felt the pain and uh, I, I hope the exhilaration of getting things published, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And we're going to operate this. I have to say a few words about the Uncrowned Queens Institute because it actually is the underpinning and the impetus for my writing. In, 2000, in 1999, my colleague and I, Peggy Brooks Bertram, uh, were asked to join a group of women called the Women's Pavilion Pan Am 2001. That group was planning to uh, celebrate the centennial of the Pan American Exposition and particularly focused on what women had done a hundred years ago uh, up through the present um, that hadn't been necessarily acknowledged. And they, they also um, wanted to look at African American women, what African American women had done um, 100 years ago with the Pan Am. And what we found out, and from an anecdote that someone told me, is that uh, African American women had been very active um, in the Pan Am. And as a matter of fact, here's pictures of them. A group called the Phyllis Wheatley Club had actually staged a protest rally um, regarding Pan Am and regarding bringing in the Pan Am, bringing in exhibits that were going to showcase the uh, accomplishments and the contributions of African Americans since the end of the Civil War. Uh, and because um, they had a specific exhibit in mind called the Negro Exhibit that was uh, uh, put together by W.E. Du Bois, and the Pan Am Board of Managers wasn't really working on getting that in. They staged this protest rally. And I had never heard about that. Of course, a lot of people had never heard about it. And I was just amazed. I'm, I'm thinking, who were these women who 100 years ago, African American women, the African American community at that time numbered about 1,697 people in a Buffalo city that had 352,000 
residents. So how was it that a group of about 200 women had actually, um, you know, protested and then had the um, Pan Am Mad Board of Managers respond to them in a way to bring them, to bring in the Negro exhibit. I thought that was phenomenal. So that kind of launched the, the writing. Um, now the, the whole emphasis for the Uncrowned Queen's webpage was to really bring the histories, the biographical histories of African American women, known, unknown, little known, um, to a site where we could collect them and put them together on this particular website. But the fact that we had these unknown women, there were a few like Mary Talbert, who was part of this group, who were known, but most of them were unknown. And as I said, that is what really started my impetus to begin to research. And in researching, um, one of the things that showed up was a picture on top that you see from uh, 19, actually it was uh, 1900, I believe. Uh, it says, oh, 1901, the Buffalo Courier, 1901, that I stumbled across this photo of these women in their clubhouse. And they met at the Michigan Street Baptist Church. That was their clubhouse. So that was very exciting for me and began this whole research. And I also have to say that now we're fortunate enough to have so many things digitized that it's a lot easier to even do the research at home uh, from, you know, on your couch, which I do sometimes at night. Um, but I had the experience of doing the microfilm thing. So, uh, you know, it was even more meaningful. So, starting with the newspapers, there we go. And looking at the various kinds of, of resources that are available, he said now certainly more digitized uh, than they were 20 years ago when I started this research. Um, newspapers are phenomenal primary resources, right? And so they provide us with some context of what was happening in the community at that time. Um, you know, they provide us with uh, confirmation, perhaps, of stories that we've, that we've heard or stories that we're trying to track down. Um, because we have now the availability of subscribing, and, and I'm not going to give you a whole lot of um, resources for paid subscriptions. We're here in the library, certainly. Um, this library, as well as other libraries, have resources that are, are not charged or that you do not have to pay a fee for. But I do find that some of the newspaper uh, subscribing uh, companies uh, that are available, you know, are, are worth the subscription. And so I tend to uh, work with newspapers.com, although the Library of Congress also provides this. I want to point out this particular newspaper article that I've highlighted uh, because uh, I also do family history. And that's why I asked many of these resources. If you are a family historian, you've already used these probably and already researched these. But my uh, family is from Louisiana. And my mother's father was a World War I soldier. Uh, and he did not go. Uh, across to, the, to war, but he did come to New York State uh, for a period of time where he was stationed here before he went back to Louisiana. Uh, my mother was probably about two or three uh, when he died in what was called a cyclone at the time in 1923. And she always told me this anecdote about him uh, getting struck by debris when the tornado came through and leveled their home, and that he died from gangrene. Uh, and that was about all that she knew or all that she told me. So when I started the research on, on the family history and began to look at, again, the newspapers, I decided to look at the newspapers around the time of the cyclone. And sure enough, on this article in 1923, in April, in Alexandria, Louisiana, is where we're from, I found a little notation about one of the last people who died as a result of his injuries 
suffered in that cyclone. His name was Gus Ellis. Uh, he was 20 some odd years old, and he was my grandfather. So those are things that, uh, again, that bring excitement, uh, that, uh, that confirm uh, stories that we may have told, that help um, in terms of our research. And I, I always find uh, myself thinking that I'm a detective because I look at clues that I find in various resources and I try to use those to connect me or, or to make hypotheses about um, things that I think the story is going to go the way I think the story is going to go and then try to find and confirm that. Another resource that has been very helpful is the U.S. Census. And again, I'm sure that many of you who have used uh, or, or are doing, working on family history have used the census. But the fact of the matter is that the census changed uh, the kinds of questions that they ask every 10 years. So sometimes, um, and I can't give you right now which particular decade, but in some decades they may have asked a woman how many children she had and how many of those children were still alive. They would have asked whether or not uh, she was married or if they were married, how long they were married. Uh, they would have asked um, the place of birth, whether uh, the city, the state, or foreign country. They would have asked whether or not there was a physical or mental disability of an, of an individual in the family. Uh, they might have asked the value of personal uh, property or the personal estate of that individual. So beyond the fact that the census gives you family information, gives you um, the uh, place where a person lived, uh, but also depending on the decade that you're looking at the census, may provide some particular special information that they collected just that decade. And so when you're looking at the census, I encourage you to, again, uh, pay real attention as to what is being asked at that time. The cemeteries. Yes, the cemeteries are wonderful resources for us for getting research. Um, and using Forest Lawn as an example, Forest Lawn has a wonderful site called Find a Loved One. And in that site, you can find, um, you can go to burial records of individuals uh, which may include um, their family um, of origin, uh, the parents, um, may include their um, date of birth, certainly their date of death, uh, it may include the cause of death as well, and where they're buried. So again, uh, if you're looking for that kind of information, uh, and because I have broadened the, the research to use these tools, not just for family research, but for the historical research that I'm doing on various individuals here in Western New York. Uh, and there are other opportunities, by the way, to express your ability to write. So for example, on this um, grade marker for Mary Burnett Talbert, I wrote the text for that uh, and, uh, and helped to raise the monies uh, along with the student group, actually the student group initiated the whole um, uh, the whole uh, project to put a marker at Mary Talbert's gravesite because her grave uh, tombstone is a very small plaque because she's buried in a single grave and it's set back from the road and so you can't find it very easily when you go to Forest Lawn. But students initiated a project to make sure we could do this, and I was fortunate enough to write the text. So don't ignore the fact that you can find a lot of history in the cemeteries. And again, when I'm looking through these research tools, um, I try to uh, put them together, band them together, to use uh, information that I might find from cemetery records to confirm something that I found in birth records or to confirm something that I found in newspaper articles. These are documents, again, that many of you probably are familiar with. 
birth certificates, death certificates, family bibles, um, and land records. Uh, if you subscribe to Ancestry.com, any of you, uh, again, another paid subscription. But I found a way to make that, that pay for me. Um, again, by using it for all of the research I, I do, not just for my family history, but looking up, again, many of the individuals that I am writing about. And certainly, city directories, again, is another really important resource to situate people uh, in particular places and occupations that, um, that they were engaged in at the time we were alive. So what do you do after you've collected all this data? And, and sometimes it becomes rather voluminous. So what I do is try to put myself a research uh, grid together, uh, organizing it as where I got the information, what the information was, uh, and maybe some particular note. Uh, I wish I could say I was really, really organized. This makes it look like I'm organized. Sometimes not so much. <laughs> because uh, I, I wind up collecting a lot of information, a lot of data that I can't necessarily put in what I write, but at least I have it. And um, per, um, per subject uh, that I'm writing about, uh, again, these grids are very helpful to help me organize and keep track of things. One of the people that I've written about uh, is a woman by the name of Ida Fairbush. And you're going to see a, um, a, a cover of the bullet or the uh, monogram that I've written about her. And Ida Fairbush was the first African American teacher in Buffalo, uh, hired in 1897. However, one of the um, things that really distresses me is that, again, we know very little about individuals, particularly African American individuals. Uh, in the community about their history. But maybe we know this one fact, this one factoid, that she was the first teacher. And I, and I find out about so many of the individuals whose names get bandied around, like Peyton Harris, for instance, who is associated with Michigan Street Baptist Church, is one of the early members, uh, and was instrumental in building the church. But then you don't know anything else. You just know this one fact. And so my goal is to broaden out the history behind these individuals. To, they were people, they, they lived, um, they were engaged in various activities, and yes, they accomplished something that has, has uh, survived them, and has been passed down, uh, maybe through oral history, maybe through some written history, but we need to know more about them, more about their contributions and uh, their, um, their achievements. So this gets me to the, the, the self-publishing and my experiences of publishing. When Peggy and I, as I said, started the web page, um, our idea was that this was really exciting. We launched this in 2001, that this was kind of groundbreaking, and that um, we would have the biographies of individuals online, that that would give us a lot of flexibility to upgrade or update bios as we got more information uh, to make corrections if we had anything wrong. And we said, we don't have to publish a book. You know, we've got this tool that will, that will really help us to continue to refresh information in a way that you can't do once you have something in print. Well, we changed that when one of our uncrowned queens said that she had printed out every copy at that time of um, uh, biographies on the web page to make her own book. So that told us, well, there, there's a community out there of people who like books, who want books. So there's, you know, we're book culture. So we decided we need to publish our own book. But we also decided that we needed to publish our own books, that we would publish it, we would pay for it. And uh, we found a printer, not a publisher, but we found her, we, we really didn't even try. We were just motivated to get some books done. So our first publication uh, here in the Blue Volume 1 is published in 2002. And then, of course, you publish it and you want to sell it. You've got to market it. You've got to go out and do the book signings. You've got to 
you know, talk about it, um, which we did. Uh, again, I think the webpage certainly helped because people understood what it was we were doing and why we were motivated um, to, to do the kind of work that we were doing with my crown of queens. Um, and volume two, and I should say these covers had a personal message as well. Uh, the first cover is my grandmother uh, on a visit of a picture, actually it was taken by my father uh, when she was in Buffalo in the 40s uh, from Louisiana on a visit. And actually I think we were at uh, Niagara Falls or somewhere um, out and about. Uh, the second one is a picture of Peggy and her sister. Uh, and uh, what we did with the second publication was I actually added an article that I had written on James B. Parker. And Parker was the first African American, was the African American uh, waiter at the Pan American who stopped the assassin from firing the, the third bullet that would have certainly killed McKinley outright. Um, and, but his story, uh, it has not been well known, and his story left a, a mystery as to what happened to him after that event. Uh, and so I've written about that. Uh, and we did a little piece in the second book that included information about James Parker. We went on to do two more volumes. Uh, and I can say we weren't concerned about making money. We didn't make any money. Any money we had went right back into the books. Um, the third volume was published on the centennial of the, two, of the 1905 founding of the Niagara Movement. And uh, again, uh, I, I wrote a piece about Buffalo's engagement and involvement and support of W.B. Du Bois and the Niagara Movement, and so that was in the third volume. The fourth volume took us out of New York State and took us to Oklahoma, which you might say, why the heck would you go to Oklahoma? <laughs> well, my colleague uh, was writing about a woman named Drusilla Dungey Houston. She's still writing about a woman named Drusilla Dungey Houston. Uh, an extraordinary Oklahoma woman uh, whose poems, Americans on Crown Queens, was the title that we used for our whole um, website and our whole uh, organization. And so um, we went to Oklahoma to participate in their centennial and to start the Uncrown Queens of Oklahoma. And from there, we wrote volume four. And in that book, I also put an article regarding an Oklahoma man who came to Buffalo, his name was James Smitherman, uh, Andrew J. Smitherman, I'm sorry, Andrew Jackson Smitherman, uh, a uh, publisher of a newspaper called the Buffalo Inquirer, the, the Buffalo Star, which is actually here in the library, which I found in the library, and I found in that, in that uh, uh, series um, the, autobiograph the autobiography that Andrew Jackson Smitherman was writing. Uh, why is he important? He was a figure in the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. He was a, a publisher there on the night of the Tulsa Star. He was run out of Tulsa, of course, as a result of his involvement in the Race Massacre. He lost everything there. He came to Buffalo and started up again in the 1930s, another newspaper which he called the Buffalo Star and became very instrumental in our community. Again, someone that very few people knew anything about and didn't know about his history. Um, as we were dabbling around and doing self-publishing, um, you see what we learned, and this is my colleague, Peggy Brooks Bertrand. You know, we had the, the, the ability to control all the, all the aspects of what we wanted, you know, how it was going to look, how many, how many uh, copies we got, uh, how we sold it, our copyright, promoting it, and so forth. It's great when you're in charge. So we loved it. We loved being in charge. We never made any money, but we didn't want, we never made say we didn't want to make money. Of course, everyone wants to benefit from what they do. But we were happy with having it published. We feel that that, that is part of our community engagement, our community responsibility, uh, our responsibility to expand the knowledge of the role that African Americans have played in this community and the history and legacy that we have here. So, you know, getting it published 
was a goal that in and, in and of itself was, you know, for us uh, perhaps a virtue. I'm not sure. But in 2009, we came up with an idea that we did go the regular route of the publisher who went to SUNY Press with an idea to, um, to publish a book of letters from African American women to the first African American first lady of the United States. We called it Go Tell Michelle, a compilation of 100 uh, articles, uh, letters, like I said, poems actually, uh, prayers written to Michelle Obama. Uh, and uh, we, we had the experience of going through the book proposal, um, the editorial, the book and the publisher, signing the contract. Um, again, we made no money. <laughs> we had a contract. Um, you know, we had uh, someone who was uh, taking all the financial burdens of, of printing and uh, setting the book up, but ultimately uh, the responsibility for promoting the book and selling the book uh, was ours. And we took a year and went across the, the, the country um, doing book signings. We had contributors from across the country and everywhere we went, uh, whether it was Mississippi, San Francisco, um, Ohio, uh, New York City, everywhere we went where we had uh, co-authors and submitters, um, we engaged them in our book signings. It was a wonderful communal experience. And of course, uh, again, um, the, the um, election of the first African-American president, as you know, was exhilarating. And so this is all part and parcel. Um, uh, again, the publishing piece was great, was wonderful, um, but it was more for uh, self-satisfaction, uh, certainly, than uh, for anything to make money. Other ways that uh, I, I've experienced the uh, opportunities to have uh, articles published, and I've been basically, um, okay, I see you five minutes, thank you. I've basically written a lot of articles because, again, the, the kind of research I'm doing on the individuals um, that, that come forth uh, that I find out a little piece about. Uh, for example, I'll give you one other example, someone I'm working on now. Um, first African American um, attorney uh, who was accepted to the bar here in 1880, uh, who was graduated from Yale University, uh, came to Buffalo, uh, became uh, very involved in politics and, and again in the law firm and so forth. Uh, and I started working on expanding his history um, to find out that he would, had escaped from slavery as a child. Eight. When I found out he had escaped from slavery, I stumbled on his father, who had escaped from slavery some 30 years before. And then I found I stumbled on his father, who had escaped from slavery 30 years before that son. So now I'm working on uh, something much longer, certainly than an article. But um, Western York Heritage magazine has been um, one of the one of the outlets that I've been fortunate to have. Um, work published in, uh, as well as the Chronicles of Oklahoma because of my work on Smitherman, and uh, then the Afro-Americans in New York Life and History, uh, which is a refuge um, journal that I also had a few uh, articles published in. Um, I also went to a Vanity Press, though. Uh, this is my dad. He was a minister, he was also a photographer, and as part of the family history, um, you know, I, I put together some things that I want to make sure that our family does. I come from a family, a large family, um, nine of us, seven brothers and a sister. As I said, was a photographer and a minister, and after his death, we found um, handwritten copies of sermons that he had done. So I wanted to make sure that I shared these with, with the rest of the family, with the grandkids, the great-grandkids, and so forth. Um, my, my experience with Eglibras was horrible. Um, this was published in 2013. Uh, they're still calling me, <laughs> saying that they've got these wonderful packets of me, and uh, you know they'll market my work and, and so forth and so on. But it was a, not a very good experience, although I did get a publication that, uh, again, has only been shared with family because it's, that's what it was meant for. Finally, uh, here are a few of the publications that 
I did um, the Fair Bush, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the publication that also was self-published, but with a, a grant from the Buffalo Teachers Federation, uh, and shared with all the schools in Buffalo, um, and Buffalo Public Schools, as well as with the library. Uh, and I'm still learning. Uh, I, I would have, uh, I have a copy that I should have, uh, spent a little bit more time working with the publisher on uh, what I would like to. This is the only picture that I found of Ida Fairbush with her students at school six, where she worked for 40 years, uh, the only school she worked at, and it's quite possible that she never taught African American students. Uh, it said that she had a, a great facility with language, and so a lot of the immigrant students, many of whom were Italian, were uh, students of hers. And I think I'm just about finished. <laughs> but I'll just leave you with uh, this little quote about being persistent. And I'm sure that, that many of you are. Um, but, uh, you know, there are times certainly when we feel a little low, I think, we've already um, expressed uh, for all of us. You know, uh, sometimes the, the feelings you have where you're not getting exactly what you want. But uh, stay positive, stay persistent and um, you will succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nevergold. Um, if there are any questions, you can come right up to the microphone in front of the stage. I'm gonna come to you. Thank you, that's very nice. Dr. Nevergold, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. I'm here. Um, I had the experience of trying to do a family history. Um, I am an Italian American, and my family's both mother and father came over from Sicily. My mother's family came over, and the one particular person who came over essentially stayed here became both an artist and a builder and paid for all of the other brothers to come over, which I think was kind of common for a lot of the immigrants. And what was interesting was two things, and I wanted to relate that to you. One was that I was old enough to know all of the sons of the first one, Angelo, who came over, I knew them personally, and I interviewed them, which was nice, because I got first-hand information. But in a second, I'll tell you the not-so-nice part of that. The other thing was that doing the book, it took me six years to research all that, and it cost a few thousand dollars out of my pocket to do it. We didn't pub I didn't publish it. And one of the reasons I didn't, and maybe you can address this also, I was not sure whether publishing that would somehow infringe on their privacy. And I was a little bit worried about that. You may talk about that. And the other thing that happened was in interviewing all of these, there were five sons, and uh, five sons and one daughter. Um, and the daughter was interesting because I always think of her as a kind of um, women's lib from way back, because when she found out that, that they had gotten some money to come over, she says, I'm going to America. And she went on the boat alone and came over. But what was interesting was, I got different stories from each of the people I interviewed. You'd think the stories would coalesce and be about the same. They weren't. And my job and my problem was to try to sift out the real story of who came over when. And one of the things I used was one of the things you talked about, manifests from the boats that told the ages. My, and I'll, I'll give this over to you in a second, my interest was that they came over on the turn of the century. And my thought was that the father who sent them over did it because Europe was gearing up for war, World War I. 
and he didn't want his sons because as soon as they turned 18, they would be in the army. That was the way they were doing things in Europe, and he didn't want to see that. What I found by the boat manifest was that they all came over just before their 18th birthday when they could have been drafted. That to me was very interesting because the father saw what was going to happen. It was a devastating World War I. But I was interested in your, did you have any problems in far, in, as far as invading privacy or anything of that sort? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for mentioning the interviewing because I, I didn't uh, address that even though that was part of what I wanted to say. Um, because I think it's important, certainly when you're doing um, oral history or any history actually, uh, again, if you have someone that you can interview. Um, but I would have included all of the stories, I think. I would not have tried to figure out uh, which was truthful or not. I would have included all of them. Um, I don't think it was necessarily an invasion of privacy. Um, um, we have something in common. I have Italian ancestry as well. Uh, my father's father was Italian. He came over in 1901 from Sicily to New Orleans, uh, and uh, um, you know, there's the whole story, obviously, in 1901, African Americans uh, and, and Italians and, and white Americans uh, were not uh, um, legally allowed to, uh, to get together in Louisiana. Matter of fact, it was dangerous in some instances if you did, but my, my, my grandfather and my grandmother obviously did because they had two children. So, I mean, there's stories like that that certainly could make somebody feel uncomfortable, but it's, it's truthful to the extent that we know, and I think it, it, it's important in the family to make sure that it happens. The other part of the, the, the family history, certainly for African Americans, that I find it's difficult to trace back that history very, very far uh, beyond 1870, for example. I can go back to 1870. But, I found a lot of information about the slaveholders. So I write a lot in the family history about the individuals I know who enslaved um, the family members' minds. So that's an important piece. But again, it's it's a it's a adventure. Uh, it's a, a detective uh, story in a sense, uh, and uh, you never stop. You know, it's a continual uh, fine research. It's interesting that the book has become a family icon because it's interesting that the book has become a family icon because I made enough copies to give to the sons. It was about 10, 12 copies. And they now use that to talk to their children. And you're right, it, it is a, a coalescence of the family generations past that they wouldn't have otherwise. You're absolutely right. This is the one that I that I did of my uh, family. And even though I didn't like the, the company I worked for, um, I'm glad I cherish this because again, it's something that I shared with all of the family and it includes photos which are also important. One more quick question. Yes. Um, Good. Is it morning? <laughs> good morning. Uh, Dr. Nimble, and thank you so much for all that you do. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Eva Doyle. I write for the oldest black newspaper in Western New York, The Criterion. Um, and by the way, my column, Eye on History, will be 45 years old in February. But um, I just want to share, I have a question. But very quickly, I, I've done my family research and I keep up with everything, as you mentioned, keep, keep in track. I found out something about my mother. She worked at um, Harbor Rundum's um, plant in Niagara Falls. I was born in Niagara Falls. And, and she worked there uh, not that long during World War II. And I, she never really talked about it. I found out through my research that she was one of those women, like the iconic Rosie the River. And um, when you see pictures of them, you don't see too many African American women, but there weren't a lot of them. My mother died of cancer many years ago. So I decided to do some research.
research, and I found out that her cancer was due to working in that chemical plant. So I hired some lawyers. <laughs> I was able to sue them. I won the case. And my family thought I was crazy. How are you going to um, prove all of this? But we were able to do it. I won a good deal of money. And so for all those naysayers in my family, they all got a portion. So I want to say that researching your family history, you never know what you're going to find out. It could benefit you. My last one, I want to ask you, you mentioned the Libras, and you were not satisfied with that. Can you give one thing that you may not want to, but <laughs> that you didn't like? That's my question. What I didn't like was um, I had to send them a, a manuscript, of course, uh, and they actually took it as it was. They didn't uh, typeset, they didn't reset the manuscript at all. So it was exactly as it was sent to them, and they were, you know, it, it, it just does not flow as they look. And so um, that was, and it was expensive. <laughs> that was the other thing. Uh, it was very, very expensive. And again, they use some pressure tactics, I think, to try to get you to sign up um, for their marketing uh, tools and other other things they say that will help you. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we'll, we'll conclude the, the questions now because we've got more speakers. Thank you, Dr. Nevergold.